Right now on Morning News Now, the clock is ticking for newborn babies at the biggest hospital in Gaza. Doctors say they no longer have power to run incubators. And it's not just medical supplies. The UN says the fuel shortage is affecting its ability to get aid to people inside Gaza. As airstrikes continue, Israel says it's working to get some of the 200 plus hostages held by Hamas back home. But so far, no breakthrough. And this morning, the IDF confirms a 19-year-old soldier taken hostage has died. We have the very latest. Back on the stand, Donald Trump Jr. testifying again in the civil fraud trial against his family's business. We're breaking down his latest appearance as the defense lays out its case trying to clear the Trump name. Plus, raising the bar after revelations of undisclosed trips and gifts to some justices, the Supreme Court is adopting a formal code of conduct for the first time. We're delving into the new rules and their impact as public confidence in the nation's highest court sinks to historic lows. And with many people getting ready to travel for the holidays, we're talking travel trends, specifically dupe traveling. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry. We're going to explain it all and how it might save you a ton of cash. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. We begin this hour in Gaza, where hundreds of patients and medics remain trapped in the Strip's largest hospital, Al Shifa Hospital. The World Health Organization is describing the situation there as nearly a cemetery. The ongoing assault by Israeli forces has left many dead and left the hospital without power. Israel claims there's a Hamas command center under the hospital. It has not provided visual evidence. Hamas and hospital staff are denying those allegations. Yesterday, we reported that 36 newborn babies had to be taken off incubators because of a lack of power. This morning, the Israeli military says it will transfer incubators to the hospital. NBC News has not been able to verify details of the IDF's claims. President Biden urging Israel to protect the hospital. It's my hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh less intrusive action relative to the hospital. Uh, we're in contact and we're with, uh, with the Israelis. Also, there is an effort to uh, uh, take this pause to deal with the release of prisoners. And that's being negotiated as well with the Qataris that are engaged. And uh, so I remain somewhat hopeful, but the hospital must be protected. In a moment, we'll hear from Maggie Vespa about a pro-Israel rally happening in D.C. today. Let's begin, though, with Josh Letterman in southern Israel. Josh, let's get the latest on the situation at Al Shifa Hospital. What are we hearing from people inside about the conditions there? And what is the status of those newborn babies and that offer of incubators from the IDF? Well, Joe, we are speaking to doctors at that hospital who say that the entire facility is basically turning into one giant morgue. There are still believed to be about 600 or so uh, patients who are trapped there with almost uh, no medical care at this point. Uh, and the authorities there say that there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 bodies they have to bury on site because they are frankly deteriorating, but they are afraid if they even go outside to find a hole to bury them, that they will get shot by uh, Israeli troops that the Israeli military acknowledges are now in the immediate uh, vicinity. As far as those incubators, uh, the health authorities there say there has been an offer by the IDF uh, to provide incubators, but it appears like it's a logistical nightmare. The Red Cross says there's no concrete plan at this point to facilitate the transfer because, remember, anyone is afraid if they go outside to get anything, to get supplies or anything else, uh, that there could they could be caught uh, in the crossfire. And so as of now, uh, it doesn't appear that the transfer of those incubators is imminent. Josh, we know the fuel shortage isn't just affecting hospitals in Gaza, but also the ability of the U.N. and aid groups to conduct their work to try and get humanitarian aid into Gaza. What are we hearing from those groups? Right, because remember, once that aid gets moved from Egypt uh, over the border into Gaza, it then has to be transferred uh, into trucks on the Gaza side, mostly U.N. trucks. And now the U.N. says that it has uh, no fuel left to be able uh, to fuel those trucks to actually bring uh, that badly needed medicine, food, uh, water to its destinations. The U.N. Uh, agency within the Gaza Strip saying its entire operation may have to close within 48 hours because of that lack of fuel, Joe. So, Josh, we have some news this morning hearing that the IDF confirming the death of a soldier who had been captured by Hamas last month. What more can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, her name is Noah Marciano, and Hamas released a video uh, that they say shows her apparently under duress uh, speaking before uh, her death. Uh, but given the fact that Gaza is an active combat zone between Hamas militants and the Israeli military, at this point we really don't know uh, what the details are uh, of how she died. But the military confirming uh, they do believe she died in part based on some Hamas video uh, that was released that appears to show uh, her body after her death. The IDF says they've now notified her family that she is among the victims of this war. And Josh, just one more thing here. There's a new U.N. report that says 200,000 people have fled northern Gaza just since November 5th. Talk to us about how dangerous their journey is across Gaza and what does await them when they get to the southern part of Gaza. It is a harrowing journey, Joe, down uh, one of two corridors the Israeli government says they've established from northern Gaza into the southern part. There have been various conflicting reports uh, of Hamas shooting at people, uh, Israel shooting at people. It's really hard, uh, frankly impossible for us to know exactly what the situation is, but there's clearly the threat of violence as those civilians are trying to make their way to safer ter territory into southern Gaza. And frankly, it's also uh, a very difficult fact for the fact that these people are uh, essentially having to leave their homes in northern Gaza, head south. They don't know if they will be allowed back to northern Gaza at any point in the future. The U.S. says it is imperative that they do be allowed to return to their homes. But there have been a number of far-right Israeli government ministers who over the last 48 hours or so have been suggesting it's possible that this displacement could be permanent, Joe. All right. Josh Letterman reporting from Israel. Josh, thank you so much. Despite the dire situation for so many in Gaza, Andrea Mitchell has the story of an international effort to help children with cancer in the midst of war zone. This morning, a glimmer of hope for some children from Gaza cut off from chemotherapy by the war until the White House, Palestinian cancer advocates and St. Jude's Hospital stepped in. Victory at last for 10-year-old Juri Zakut, one of 21 Palestinian children with cancer. Safe in an Egyptian hospital, flashing a sign of victory. The children with parents or guardians at the center of a secret international mission since the war began to rescue them from Gaza. Their joy tempered by reality. She says, I would lie if I said I was optimistic and my family is still in Gaza. I am afraid for them and our house has been hit. <laughs> Tahani came to Egypt with four-year-old Omar, leaving behind their family for the chance to save his life. She says, I had the feeling of any mother who was afraid for her son. I was afraid that his treatment would stop. It's been a treacherous journey, especially after Israel warned the hospital and then attacked. The evacuation initiated by cancer advocates at the Palestine Children's Rescue Fund and St. Jude's Hospital with help from Egypt, Jordan and the U.S. The president was closely involved in helping children get out of Ukraine uh, that, were, uh, that needed cancer treatment. Immediately upon hearing about this request, uh, the president directed us to do whatever we could to help these uh, you know, civilians who were in uh, very acute situations uh, get out of Gaza. Two-year-old Faf and her father left her mom and siblings behind. <laughs> Sadness mixed with relief. They start to smile for the first time and they start to feel secure. It's very relieving and we hope that we can uh, do that for all the needed children in uh, Gaza. With the children's hospital in Gaza now closed, 31 children remain trapped in the war zone. Some approved to get out, but displaced from their homes and hard to locate. Back to you. All right, Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much. Back here in the U.S., Washington, D.C. is preparing for a huge rally today. Tens of thousands are expected on the National Mall to show their support for Israel. The march will echo growing calls for the release of more than 200 hostages in Gaza. And it comes as incidents of anti-Semitism continue to increase following the attack by Hamas. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Chicago with more. So, Maggie, you are at O'Hare, and that's because right now Jewish Americans from where you are are traveling to D.C. for this rally. What more can you tell us? Right. Right, from where I am, from airports, from cities, from congregations, Joe, across the country. We're in Terminal 3 at O'Hare because we're waiting for a local rabbi, and we're told 
uh, several members of his congregation, including adults and high school seniors who are going to fly this morning to D.C. for the March for Israel this afternoon. And we've seen reports from our affiliates and our producers have uh, been in touch with communities across the country. I mean, for instance, in Raleigh, North Carolina, several busloads of Jewish Americans are going to make their way to D.C. this morning. From Ohio State University, our Columbus affiliate confirming that that school in uh, connection with its Hillel um, and also the Jewish United Fund, who's subsidizing a lot of these trips, they'll be sending two busloads of college students to D.C. for the March for Israel. And of course, we know, uh, especially on college campuses, the rise in an uh, anti-Semitism has been especially alarming. We've been covering that for weeks on end here at NBC. So the message from those campuses and the message from those we've heard in the Chicago area is the same, that they will not be cowed, they will not be silenced by this rise in hate. And that's what we expect to see in D.C. later today, Joe. And Maggie, this march came together rather quickly. What more can you tell us about what we expect right. to see? So organizers of the March for Israel, which is set to start at 1 Eastern in front of the Capitol, uh, say they expect up to 100,000 Jewish Americans to descend essentially on D.C. today for that rally, again, from across the country, again, sending the message uh, supporting Israel in this war against Hamas since the October 7th attacks, and also, as you said, calling for the release of those hostages. So as far as today is concerned, obviously security uh, is a peak interest, a peak concern in D.C. People here uh, echoing that as well. But we expect to see, and this is what organizers want, a largely peaceful rally, again, just filled with Jewish Americans from communities across the country who just want to make their voices heard. So a huge event expected today, Joe. Yeah, and speaking of security, this has been designated a level one security event. So explain to us what that right. is and how law enforcement just plans to keep everyone safe. Sure. The Department of Homeland Security telling us that is the highest designation of security, uh, meaning that the alert level is high. This is kind of like in conjunction with what you would see for the Super Bowl. This just means that local authorities, federal authorities are on peak alert, knowing the eyes that are on this, knowing the message that is being sent, basically uh, the risk level there. And just to kind of put it in perspective, obviously, you know, we've been covering this here at NBC ad nauseum, but, but the anti-Semitic um, sort of statistics showing that the spike in anti-Semitism nationwide are alarming. The Anti-Defamation League, who uh, we've been hearing from leading up to today's rally, releasing new stats saying that we've had more than 300 incidents since the October 7th attacks alone. That rise marking a 400 percent increase from this time last year. So again, security high going into today's 1 p.m. rally. Yeah, in the wake Ciao. of some startling numbers. All right, Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Staying in D.C., we're learning more about what happened Sunday when Secret Service agents protecting President Biden's oldest granddaughter opened fire on several people. The agency spokesman says those people were attempting to break into an unoccupied government vehicle. Officials say no one was hit in the incident, which happened outside Naomi Biden's home in Washington's Georgetown neighborhood. Let's get the latest from NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist. So Aaron, first of all, walk us through what happened, what we're learning, and how close was this to Naomi? It wasn't close to her at all, really, Joe. As we understand it from the Secret Service, this happened uh, Sunday night, just before midnight. Several Secret Service agents assigned to protect Naomi by Neil uh, saw a group of people, two to three people, at this unoccupied, unmarked uh, Secret Service vehicle, uh, breaking one of the windows there. One of the Secret Service agents opened fire on uh, these people, and as we understand it, no one was hit, no one, nobody was hurt here, uh, and then those suspects took off in a red car. It's obviously unusual that something like this would happen. The Secret Service making the point to say that uh, the protectee was not hurt, and sources tell us that uh, there's no confirmation that Naomi Biden was even aware that something like this had happened. Uh, at this point, the D.C. Police Department, in conjunction with the Secret Service investigating this, looking for those suspects uh, who tried to break into or who did break this window of this Secret Service vehicle, Joe. Baron, is the White House saying anything about this? Uh, no, not really. The, the White House press secretary was asked about this during her briefing yesterday. She uh, referred questions to the Secret Service about this incident and said that uh, this is, uh, you know, she was asked whether the, pr the president had spoken to his granddaughter about this, and she said it's a private issue, uh, and she wasn't going to address whether the Bidens had had conversations about what happened Sunday night. Hey, and, you know, crime is a worry right now. This incident comes as the number of carjackings and auto thefts in the nation's capital is going up. And there is another recent high-profile example, right? 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is an issue that has been growing in D.C. all year long. As we understand it, there have been uh, more than 860 carjacking incidents uh, in the District of Columbia this year, more than 6,000 car thefts in D.C. this year. And you mentioned a high-profile incident. We know uh, a few weeks back, Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar was carjacked at gunpoint uh, here in D.C. in the, the Navy Yard area. Uh, of D.C., not far from the Capitol. He gave his car over in that incident. It was found later, but it really highlights uh, just how much this has become a problem here in D.C. The police department, the local police department, has started a task force to try to address this issue. Most of the carjackings that happened in D.C. this year uh, were, were involved weapons, and we understand that from statistics released by the D.C. Police Department, of the 140-some-odd arrests that have been made in carjacking incidents, uh, the majority of them were children, 12 to 17-year-olds, who have been arrested in these cases, Joe. Wow. All right, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much. Former President Trump's attorneys are continuing to lay out their case as his civil fraud trial resumes this morning here in New York. Donald Trump Jr. returned to the stand yesterday for a second time. This time, he was the defense's first witness. Now, during the testimony, Donald Jr. praised his father's real estate deals and his, quote, incredible vision. New York Attorney General's office alleges the Trump Organization grossly inflated the value of company assets to the company's advantage. Former President Trump and his children deny those allegations. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard is following it all for us. So, Von, what did we hear from Donald Trump Jr. this time around compared with what we heard when he testified as a state witness? Right. The difference this time around is that he was answering questions from his own defense attorney. Very different than the first go around when he was answering questions from the New York Attorney General's prosecutor, who's the one that filed the civil lawsuit against him and his family and the Trump Organization. For this go around, what Donald Jr. was able to do over the course of more than four hours was provide a narrative, lay out the history of the Trump Organization and the various properties that it owns, uh, describing them in, with words like, quote, spectacular, to make the case that, in fact, a great number of these, val uh, of these properties and assets were actually undervalued and that the New York Attorney General's lawsuit was misguided. There was little in the form of actually answering questions as it related to him signing off on the financial statements and the extent to which he was involved in the compilation of those records. He had placed blame previously on the accountants, who he is a top executive at the Trump Organization relied on. So for yesterday, this was part of an opportunity for Don Jr. to lay out on behalf of his family a defense of why the properties and why the Trump Organization was valued at the levels that they were on the documents. So, Vaughn, in addition to John, Don Jr., that was, of course, the big name. We did also hear from Trump's former tax lawyer. He took the stand. What can you tell us about that? And what does this tell us about Team Trump's strategy? How will former President Trump's testimony fit into all this? Right. The second witness called by the defense was Sherry Dillon, who worked as a tax, uh, uh, a tax advisor for Donald Trump. She's not a lawyer, but a tax advisor. And she laid out in her testimony that she had worked with the likes of Eric Trump uh, to work on some of these financial statements. And she described her uh, 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 the reasoning behind some of the uh, appraisals and the values of the properties, you know, comparing it to Taylor Swift, that if Taylor Swift sold the home, she'd sell it for a higher value than if Sherry Dillon herself was selling the exact same home. Of course, for the defense, this is now uh, trying to get the judge to throw out the several other claims that were brought against Don Jr., Eric, the father in the Trump Organization, because the judge is already in a summary judgment ruled that uh, uh, financial fraud uh, repeatedly took place by uh, each of these defendants here. And so now this is selling from the defense and by these witnesses in an effort to stave off any serious penalties, financial or even the suspension of the business license of the Trump Organization in the state of New York. Joe. All right. Von Hilliard, thank you so much. The Supreme Court announced it has formally adopted what it calls a code of conduct for the nine justices. The move follows allegations of ethical lapses that have raised questions about whether some justices were violating broadly accepted standards of conduct for judges. The court released a 14-page document outlining the standards of conduct on issues, for example, when the justices should recuse themselves and what kind of outside activities they can engage in. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Zabalos for more on this. Danny, so the court put out a statement 
statement about this new code of conduct. It says the rules and principles outlined aren't new, but that the lack of formal code has recently led to, quote, the misunderstanding that the justices of this court, unlike all other jurists in this country, regard themselves as unrestricted by any ethics rules. So what are these new rules? And just the fact that they had to do this or felt they had to do this, what does that say? The new rules are really the old rules. They're the same rules that have always applied to every federal judge under the Supreme Court. That's magistrate judges, district court judges, uh, circuit court of appeals judges. Those codes of ethics have already been in place for some time. And if you ask the Supreme Court justices two or three years ago, uh, they would probably say, if they were being candid, that they already were loosely following the spirit of those rules, even if they didn't explicitly apply to the justices. So now this just codifies uh, something that was already existing in the sense that it applied to every other judge, every other federal judge, but these nine. The real problem, though, is enforcement. Yeah, let's talk about that, because lawmakers react to this, say, hey, good, this is a step in the right direction, but then fall short because the justices basically enforce it themselves, right? So explain what we can expect there. Are there any teeth in this? This new code doesn't contain any enforcement mechanism or enforcement system. Not a big surprise, but in a sense, you could argue that the Supreme Court has always been subject to a kind of code of ethics. First, even though there's no enforcement mechanism for this, nothing stops a party before the court from, say, bringing a motion and saying, hey, judge, hey, justices, take a look at this now that there's an existing code. Uh, take a look at this and tell us if you are violating it. You need to recuse yourself. Now, the problem is if they don't recuse themselves, there's really no comeback for that. Another thing to think about is that, in a sense, Congress has always enforced a code of ethics against federal judges. When you think about impeachment, the vast majority of the 20 or so impeachments in our country have been federal judges. Judges, In fact, there's virtually nobody else other than a couple presidents. I don't need to name names. You know who I'm talking about. But we have impeached, on the whole, only federal judges, which reflects that we've always imposed a kind of code of ethics on the federal judiciary, including one Supreme Court justice. So the Supreme Court justice has always been subject to other forms of discipline. And I use that with air quotes. All right. Air quotes always come in handy. Danny Zavallos, thank you so much. Appreciate your analysis here. With the deadline for a government shutdown now just days away, Democrats are now signaling they could support a plan by Speaker Mike Johnson. House Republicans are expected to take up the bill today, a two-step strategy to fund the government. Speaker Johnson will need some help from Democrats in order to get the measure passed and avert the first government shutdown in nearly five years. That deadline this Friday. Speaking from the Oval Office yesterday, President Biden said he's not rushing to judgment on the speaker's plan. I understand that uh, the new Speaker of the House has a proposal. It's being negotiated with the minority leader of the House and Senator Schumer and uh, and uh, the uh, Republican leader are also talking about it. I, I'm not going to make a judgment what I'd veto, what I'd sign, but let's wait and see what they come up with. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale with the latest on, on all this. So, Ali, we know this two-step plan involves no spending cuts, so lay it out for us. Where do things stand right now, and how much support is this perhaps getting from Democrats on the Hill? You know, Joe, Savannah made fun of me yesterday because the way I described Democrats' reaction to what House Republicans have put forward is they're mad, but they're not that mad. And that matters because when you look at the way that this plan has to go through at least the House side, they made a procedural move last night that accounts for the fact that, you know, roughly 40 to 50 House Republicans are really angry about this plan and will vote no on it. But they also account for the fact that Democrats are likely to go along with it. That's because it needs to pass by a two-third majority in order to pass the House. We're going to see them move on that at some point today. But the fact that this has no cuts in it makes it easier for Democrats to swallow, especially if it means being able to not shut down the government over the holidays. That would be catastrophic. But they're also all very tired. They've been in session now for 10 weeks. All of us go to work every day, week by week, but that's not always the way the House works. So they're fatigued from the fact that Republicans had weeks and weeks of chaotic mess trying to find their next next speaker. It seems like what they want to do is push this into next year so they can have more conversations around the ways that Republicans want to find funding cuts and the ways that Democrats want to counter that.
So not that mad is the new happy on Capitol Hill. Let's just go with that. But there not are, happy. Exactly. <laughs> there, there are some fellow Republicans who are, who are kind of mad about this. They're opposed to the House Speaker's plan. Lay out some of their concerns. They're very upset, including people like Congressman Chip Roy and other members of the House Freedom Caucus, in part because they feel like as the opening gambit of the House of, of the new speaker's tenure, they wanted to see him push a little bit more on the funding cuts that they had been pushing for over the course of the last year. You'll remember, and Chip Roy and others have made this parallel very clear in conversations with me and other reporters. The reason we have Speaker Johnson is because Speaker McCarthy passed a clean continuing resolution with the help of Democrats. The only thing that Johnson is doing differently here is doing it with two funding deadlines on the back end of it as opposed to just one. There is nothing different in what Johnson is doing here in terms of the fact that he is not adding any extra cuts. He's not including any of the priorities that people like the Biden administration and others wanted on Ukraine aid, on Israel aid, on Taiwan aid. This is basically just a continuation of the norm. And for a lot of conservatives, members of this House Republican conference, that is the problem, and it's why they're voting against it. Allie, one more thing I want to touch on while we have you. Jacob Chansley, that's an Arizona man who stormed the Capitol on January 6, 2021, perhaps better known as the QAnon shaman with the horns and the face paint. Yeah. He ultimately pleaded guilty to a count of felony obstruction of an official proceeding. Now he plans to run for Congress. What can you tell us about that? Well, look, this is one of the things that we've seen since January 6th and the insurrection, not just people who participated there trying to run for office, but of course now some of the people who were in many ways the faces of the insurrection now thinking that they should give it a go themselves. I do think that it's notable when Chansley talked about not just pleading guilty to entering the chamber and of course being one of the people who was riling the crowd with his bullhorn. He also said that he thought it was inexcusable for him in the the aftermath to have entered the chamber that day. Now, of course, he's trying to mount a bid in Arizona's 8th Congressional District, where there's been a recent Republican retirement by Debbie Lesko, to try to actually enter the chamber as a lawmaker. Now, we'll see how this goes. We're in the very early days, but Arizona is a fascinating state for this to be happening in. On the one hand, it's one of the key places that we saw challenges to the 2020 election in the form of the cyber ninjas and the audits, but then also it was a bulwark in the name of democracy in certifying its election results for Joe Biden. All right, we'll see what happens. Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Coming up, the FCC set to decide this week on new guidelines that could help domestic violence victims. We're going to break down how it works and why supporters say it could save lives. But first, the city of San Francisco getting a big makeover ahead of a meeting between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Why the fact that it even needs a makeover at all is causing some bad press. Welcome back. Tomorrow, President Biden is meeting face to face with Chinese President Xi Jinping for their first talk in a year. But as leaders of the world's two biggest economies sit down in San Francisco, the host city's reputation for crime and economic turmoil is taking center stage. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward takes a closer look. San Francisco is already a target of America's conservative media. San Francisco has hit rock bottom and they need an intervention. Now, the arrival of the 21 APEC nations and the backdrop of the high-stakes meeting between two of the world's most powerful men means it is under the spotlight globally. It'll get scrutiny from countries like China, which already judges the place pretty harshly. A city where millions of immigrants once came to chase the American dream is now a place where many are trying to flee from. Chinese tourists have mocked the city's rough reputation on social media, and diplomats used past episodes like 2020's Black Lives Matter protests to depict democracy as a failed experiment. Racial discrimination against minorities is chronic sickness in American society. After the pandemic and remote work emptied San Francisco's downtown, local businesses are eager for this week of Asian Pacific power players. APEC is going to be wonderful for the city. Gil Payumo is ready. It comes in a perfect moment. We need this, you know, drastically. But is the city? San Francisco has been repaving streets and power washing train stations to prepare for 30,000 visitors from 21 nations. The delegates, the press, the CEOs, right. it's going to be pretty, right. pretty amazing. San Francisco's mayor says it's a chance to turn the city's image around. We expect lasting impacts on 
our city, uh, whether it's the economy, tourism, conventions, and also just really uh, the narrative about San Francisco. Are there any steps that you've tried to take as mayor ahead of APEC to keep a diplomatic core member from, you know, wandering into the wrong part of the city? We are not trying to hide what the problems are of San Francisco. And we hope that people get a chance to experience, of course, great parts of San Francisco, but also know that we have our challenges and they are not as bad as what people are trying to portray them as. It is a beautiful city full of picturesque scenes, but a visitor doesn't have to walk far to encounter some misfortune. The summit cordoned off several blocks of downtown, and people living on the streets in that area have been moved by city crews in recent days. The city will be patrolled by state, federal, and city officers all week. But how San Francisco is portrayed abroad is not up to the mayor. People have their own plans, their own agendas for whatever they decide they want to use San Francisco for. And what I like to do is make sure that people have at least the opportunity to experience it for themselves. With so many visitors in town and world leaders dueling over trade and diplomacy, APEC summit here could fuel spin about the condition of the West, sure. But for at least some of the delegates, they'll go home with memories of a meal, a sunset, a view from the hilltops. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. More international headlines. Mexico's first openly non-binary magistrate was found dead in their home. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavaga has that and some other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Well, that's right. Mexico's first non-binary magistrate uh, was were found dead uh, in their apartment in an apparent uh, knife attack. Now, the state uh, prosecutor in Mexico uh, said the magistrate called Jesus Ociel Baena and a second person believed to be their partner was found dead in were found dead in their apartment Monday morning with injuries consistent with knife wounds. Now, Baena uh, was one of Mexico's most prominent LGBTQ plus activists and was sworn in as the first non-binary electoral magistrate in Latin America a little over than a year ago. Mexico's president, Andres Obrador, said an investigation will be carried out and that, an invest and that at the moment it's not known uh, whether it's, it was an homicide or an accident. Now let's move south to El Salvador, where the government introduced a more than $1,000 fee for travelers coming from India and 57 other countries, mainly from Africa. Authorities called it an airport improvement fee, but it's also believed to be the result of pressure from the U.S. to help control migration flows to its southern border. The Aviation Authority in El Salvador said most passengers arriving from those countries then fly to Nicaragua, a major transit point for migrants who then try to reach the United States. And let's end this tour of the world in space, where a new object is orbiting the Earth, a toolbox. It was left behind by two astronauts who carried out maintenance work outside the International Space Station on the 1st of November. NASA said that during the hours-long spacewalk, the tool bag gave them the slip and was literally lost in space. According to a website tracking cos cosmic events, the tool bag could potentially be spotted from Earth with a simple pair of binoculars in the next few months before it disintegrates in the planet's atmosphere. So take out your binoculars and telescopes and see whether you can spot the screwdriver in space. <laughs> That's a good warning. And if you need some tools, then maybe you can reach up and grab them. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate that. <laughs> Time for your morning news now. Weather, heavy rains headed for the Gulf with a closer look at that system. And more meteorologist Angie Lastman is with us. Angie, do you need a toolbox? <laughs> you know, there's no screwdrivers in my forecast, Joe. I can confirm that. Uh, we, we do need the umbrellas, though. That should be in your toolbox here over the next couple of days as we gear up for more rain, no surprise, along the Gulf Coast. We've also seen some of these flood watch being added specifically into tomorrow and lasting through Thursday along portions of the Florida coast, the Atlantic coast specifically. We know it doesn't take a whole lot of rain for them to see flood concerns there, so we're, we are going to have to deal with that here over the next couple of days. I'll show you that here in a moment, but first let's focus on today. We've got a slow moving system that's kind of hanging out and slowly but surely working its way across portions of the Gulf of Mexico and leaving us with plenty of moisture to tap into from New Orleans through the, the panhandle of Florida and up into portions of northern Florida, even Tampa down to Fort Myers. You could see some off and on showers through the day today, but some pockets of heavy rain will be there. And, you know, we need the rain in this area, but more of it is on the way, not just today, but into tomorrow, too, and specifically across the state of Florida. Notice how this heavy rain is kind of draped across the southern tier. 
Uh, like I said, doesn't take much to see flooding there. So from West Palm to Miami, we'll see that flood concern as we get into tomorrow specifically. Now, we're talking anywhere from uh, widespread amounts, maybe an inch to two inches, but the higher amounts will range from three to four inches from West Palm to Miami down through Key West. And we could see a localized amounts up to six and even as high as eight inches. So watch for the flood concerns in those areas. Now, widespread warmth across the Midwest and the Northern Plains, mid 60s for Chicago today, running 70 or running at 70 degrees this afternoon and 20 degrees above normal in Omaha, 66 for St. Louis. We'll head to the upper 60s for Denver. So overall, that warmth really sticks with us, not just today, but into tomorrow too. Mid 60s on tap for Milwaukee, uh, 70 degrees for St. Louis, 69 for Kansas City. So these temperatures will hang out above normal for the next couple of days, but then they really take a tumble as we get to Friday and even into Saturday. Chicago will drop down to the mid or to the lower 50s from the mid 60s, and uh, New York will end up at 55 degrees on Saturday. Joe, With those warm temps are confusing as we're planning for Thanksgiving. <laughs> They're very confusing, but at least there's no snow in the forecast. That's a good point. For yeah. travel, and you can yeah, buy, we'll and you see. Can buy your turkey. We're wearing shorts or something. Like that. <laughs> exactly. All right, thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. No Coming up, we all know getting a good night's sleep is not as easy as it sounds, but a new study could help ease your mind. We got that story next. Welcome back. More than 12 million Americans are the victims of domestic violence each year. For many of them, a cell phone is both a lifeline and a way for their abusers to track them. Now the Federal Communications Commission is considering a new set of rules. It will force phone companies to be more responsive and sensitive to cases of domestic violence. NBC News correspondent Noah Pransky explains. You know a cell phone as your daily planner, or your gaming device, or a social outlet. But to someone in an abusive relationship, it's a lifeline. He got so mad and he started choking me and my son woke up and he was crying and that did not stop him from keep, come, keep going. Joanne, a domestic violence survivor, remembers that one night particularly well. I eventually uh, managed to, you know, run out the house without shoes and uh, I run to the neighbor to ask for a phone so I can call the cops because he had took all the phones from me. Joanne has a complicated relationship with phones. She said it was a way for her ex to monitor her. It was a tool of control for years. A lot of people are depending financially from their abusers. Until she finally separated from her family plan and got her own phone. If you've ever tried to change your cell phone number or your cell phone plan, you know how incredibly challenging it can be even without an abusive relationship. But adding domestic violence and it gets exponentially harder. That though is about to change. The Federal Communications Morning. Commission is set to vote Wednesday on landmark new guidelines that will force cell phone providers to be more responsive to victims of domestic violence. Part of the Safe Connections Act, the new rules will mask calls to domestic violence hotlines and shelters from cell phone bills, make it easier for victims to separate from their family plans, and provide new low-cost phones for men and women who need to escape a dangerous situation. If you are living through really unthinkable circumstances and suffering quietly with domestic abuse, it is hard to pick up that phone and call someone, and it's doubly hard if you know that there's going to be a record of it that your abuser will see. Jessica Rosenworcel, the first woman to ever lead the FCC, has been shaping the new regulations with input from advocates, including those of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Are you safe to talk right now? Which makes 90,000 contacts each month, more than a million each year. And most of those victims reach out via cell phone. You know, I think about when I worked in a local shelter and a woman coming in with her kids. I'm going to start crying. I to be A woman coming in to the shelter with her children and the cell phone being the vehicle that she would use to look for a job, to call the local clinic, to be able to communicate with her kid's school. We have to be able to have the ability for her to do that safely and privately to protect not only her life, but her children's life. According to the hotline, one in four women and one in seven men will experience physical violence in their lifetime. Rosenworcel wants to try to improve those numbers. When I took over the Federal Communications Commission, this is not the things that I thought I would do, be doing with my day today, but it's been among the most gratifying work we're doing. 
And Joanne, now years removed from her bad situation, is glad other victims will have one more tool to build their exit plans. Being able to get your own plan kind of make you feel somehow, I know it might sound weird, but self-sufficient as a person. Our thanks to Noah Pransky for that important report. And if you are in an abusive relationship and want help, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233, available 24 hours a day. Time now for our weekly mental health check-in. We all know it's hard to get a good night's sleep, especially if you're worried about getting a good night's sleep, but a new study might be able to help. For more on that and more, let's bring in Dr. George James, a licensed marriage and family therapist. Dr. James, good to have you with us. So most of us have probably been caught in a cycle where you're worrying about your sleep and that keeps you awake. The term is sleep anxiety. So what are some of the best methods for dealing with that? Sure, you're right. Uh, the people can worry about their sleep, which helps, it keeps them from falling asleep and it increases things like anxiety. So one of the things that people can do is to have a regular sleep schedule. Be careful of monitors before you go to sleep. Practice relaxation and, and exercise and really be careful of how much caffeine and alcohol you take in. And hopefully, if you have a chance to be able to talk to someone that can help you deal with the things that are causing some anxiety at night. All those things will help. No caffeine after noon for me because I have to wake up in the middle of the night. All right, let's move on to another subject. Black women are regularly shown to have higher levels of stress than their white counterparts. That includes a study that was published by Women's Health Reports last year. So now there's this trend on social media suggesting some ways to help. So what kinds of solutions are these creators coming up with to try and help black women prioritize their health? You know, this study is very important. It really highlights the intersection of racism and sexism that black women might experience. And so being able to take breaks, being able to have moments of uh, of sabbaticals, which is called wellness sabbaticals, is really important. Uh, being able, uh, be able to celebrate micro joys, moments that, that, that they can feel happy and good about what is going on in their life. And being able to just sometimes take a moment to just stay in the bed and not get out and rest and relax, which is called bed riding. So these are moments that can be really helpful. Uh, I know there's also something called touch therapy, where you can be able to feel the, the, the pleasure of being connected to other people by, by touch. Micro joys. I really like that. I think we could all benefit from those micro joys. All right. Last thing I want to talk to you about. This may sound obvious that being alone can make you lonely, but there's actually a new study looking at how the amount of time you're on your own can affect those feelings of loneliness. What more can you tell us about that? You know, what the study has actually found is that uh, something that maybe we thought about that as you get older, you can experience loneliness more and actually specifically after 68. And some of this is because uh, sometimes we stop working, our work relationships have changed, and so we can feel more disconnected. But also, we talk a lot of negative about social media, but social media can also be helpful in people feeling more connected and less lonely. And that you can actually feel lonely when you're around others. So it's really important that you find ways to stay connected, that you reach out to people, and that you let people know because sometimes loneliness can lead to things like depression, heart disease, uh, stroke. And so we don't want people to feel lonely. And as much as possible, check in on those that you care about, your friends and family, so that they don't feel lonely. We're learning so much about the benefits, not just your mental health, but physical help of connecting with other people. All right, Dr. George James, is always good to have you with us. Thank you so much. Coming up, traveling to your dream destination could cost you a fortune, but a TikTok trend called dupe traveling could be changing that. We're going to explain what it is and how it's saving people money and getting them a cool trip just after the break. Back now with some money news. Major automaker Stellantis offering big time buyouts to cut costs. CNBC Savannah now joins us with that and other financial headlines. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, so Chrysler's parent company Stellantis is offering buyouts to about half its U.S. salaried employees. Now, the move comes as the automaker looks to cut costs as it shifts to electric vehicles and after agreeing to the new UAW contract. Now, employees must have at least five years of experience to be eligible, and those who do take the package would leave the company by the end of the year. This is the second buyout Stellantis has offered this year. Amazon is cutting more than 180 jobs in its gaming division. It's also shutting down parts of the business that focus on streaming and support third-party games. 
Amazon will devote more effort to developing its own games with upcoming launches such as Blue Protocol and future games based on Tomb Raider and The Lord of the Rings. Amazon has cut 27,000 jobs company-wide since last fall. And Uber is introducing new features to address the issue of drivers being unfairly deactivated from the app. A new tool will now identify riders or Uber Eats customers who repeatedly give bad ratings with the intent of getting a refund. Uber says allegations by those customers won't factor into a driver's rating or decision whether to deactivate them. Uber will also give drivers more information about why their account was deactivated and allow them to request a review, Joe. These mean there. people who keep giving everyone right? bad Come reviews. On. Exactly. <laughs> they just want a refund. That's no, all, okay. apparently. Okay, so. all right. Samana, thank you so much. Yeah. It's a popular trend taking off on TikTok that's now spreading to the travel industry. We're talking about the dupe trend where influencers seek out cheaper alternatives to the usual hotspots. And with travel costs rising, experts say that finding cheaper duplicates or dupes is a good way to save money on trips as we head into the new year. Expedia Group travel expert Melanie Fish joins us now with more on this. So I have to admit, I didn't know much about this this morning. So explain to us what is dupe travel and how has it become so popular? Well, a TikTok dupe is an exact copy. In travel, a dupe destination isn't an exact copy. It's a less popular, probably less expensive destination that offers a similar experience to a more traditional popular travel destination. So according to Expedia, flight searches for dupes, for dupe travels have increased. What are some of the most popular destinations? What are these dupes? Yeah, the 2024 destinations of the year are all places where flight searches have jumped more than 100%. But a lot of these places are offering flight savings. So, for example, Taipei is a dupe for Seoul, kind of a little sister city. If you're going in March, a flight from L.A. is going to be about $870 to Taipei. If you're going to Seoul, it's going to be $1,100. Another dupe on the list, Quebec City. It's a dupe for Geneva because uh, I just oh. went for the first time and I have to tell you, I am in love with this place. It's yeah. magical. It's a European-like city, cobblestone streets, a castle on the hill, laughter tinkling <laughs> from, the, from the cafes. But you're still in North America, so of course you're saving money on that flight because you're not heading across an ocean and you're saving a lot of time. We're talking about a two-hour flight from New York right. as opposed to a 10-hour flight to Geneva. And while you're there, you can maybe stop by Montreal if, if it's in your budget. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. And we've course, had many more listed there, some great examples. So this goes beyond, of course, the flight. That's usually the first thing we look for. But we're also thinking about affordable hotels and good affordable food, right? A dupe food is nothing new. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I love street food, and I would argue that maybe the street food or the less expensive food in a destination is not the dupe. It's actually the original source of food culture, and maybe the fancy food is the dupe. But I think you can mix it up on a trip if you want to save money and have some different experiences. Now, hotels, a lot of these destinations on the list do have lower average daily hotel rates. So there's definitely savings to be had there. As a matter of fact, the trifecta of savings, I would say, would be Paros, which is a dupe for Santorini, because mm. both beautiful Greek islands, you're saving about 55% to get there, you're saving about $100 a night on your accommodations, and you are definitely saving yourself the aggravation of a <laughs> lot of crowds. So that's an example yeah, of no the dupe saving you in three different areas. Don't dupe the crowds, just the, just right, the experience. Right, right, exactly. Right. Very cool. This was fun. Melanie Fish, thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks for morning. having me. Coming up, they were convicted unfairly now more than a century later, justice at last for more than 100 black U.S. soldiers. That story up next. Finally this hour, some long overdue justice. After more than a century, the U.S. Army has formally restored the honor of more than 100 black American soldiers. Here's NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson. Amazing. Honor restored to the 110 men of the all-black 24th Infantry's 3rd Battalion. More than a century after the Army convicted them of murder, mutiny, and assault, executing 19. Among them... Private First Class Thomas C. Hawkins. Jason Holt's uncle. What does today mean to you? 
justice. And we don't know what he would have been, but that was all taken away. The regiment arrived in the Jim Crow South in July 1917. On August 23rd, a black corporal was reportedly shot at and beaten by police. The soldiers were told a mob was coming. Threats spurred a group of more than 100 black soldiers to seize weapons and leave camp, thinking that they were marching in their own self-defense. Melee ensued. 19 people died. Most were white. 110 black soldiers eventually stood trial. All were convicted. Now with the Army setting aside these convictions and upgrading... The U.S. Army issued honorable discharges, making their survivors eligible for benefits. It's never too late to correct an injustice, and that overturning these court-martials was the right thing to do. Your uncle wrote a letter to his parents, and he wrote, oh, I am not guilty of the crime that I am accused of. He demonstrated courage, he demonstrated conviction, he demonstrated how he was sticking to certain principles. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Houston. Thank you, Priscilla, for that report. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, a dire situation in some of Gaza's biggest hospitals. Evacuations of the sick and wounded reportedly stalling as violence between Israel's military and Hamas closes in. President Biden advocating for civilian safety in Gaza yesterday as fears grow over some of the hospital's youngest patients. My hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh less intrusive action relative to the hospital. So I remain somewhat hopeful that the hospital must be protected. Well, in Washington today, security preparations ramping up for what's expected to be the largest pro-Israel march since the war began. We are covering it all. A new code of conduct for the Supreme Court, the updated set of ethics rules signed by all nine justices in the wake of multiple reports of undisclosed, often lavish perks. Also, emotional testimony from Paul Pelosi yesterday, the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who was violently assaulted in the couple's San Francisco home last year. We'll bring you his harrowing account of that night and the ongoing trial of his accused attacker. And later in the hour, we are flipping the script with the aptly named Girl Conductor. We're going to talk about her decorated career and, of course, all that practice, 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 which led her to one of music's most revered stages, Carnegie Hall. We begin this hour with the ongoing humanitarian disaster unfolding in the middle of the Israel-Hamas war. Overnight, Israeli forces bombarded the length of the Gaza Strip. This video shows the aftermath of a strike on the Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza. It comes as hundreds of medics and patients remain trapped at the Al-Shifa hospital, described as nearly a cemetery by the World Health Organization. Doctors say the lives of 36 newborn babies remain at risk after they were taken off incubators because of a lack of power. We have a team standing by to talk about all of this and more. Let's start with our NBC News chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons in Tel Aviv. Keir, good morning. So good morning to you. And you can see and hear the storm that has hit the region. We don't know whether that it's impacting Gaza itself, but you can imagine the impact it may be having if that is the case. As you mentioned uh, right now, much of the focus this morning is on the largest hospital in the Gaza Strip, the Al-Shifa Hospital. Now, three senior doctors at that hospital tell NBC News that they have not seen Hamas in that hospital. But a former Israeli intelligence officer tells NBC News there's no doubt there's a Hamas headquarters under Al-Shifa. Israel has proof. I saw it in the past. Overnight, Israel's airstrikes, unrelenting. This was Jabalia refugee camp in the north. And our team in Gaza, documenting more children pulled from the rubble in the south. Continued shelling and gunfire, making evacuating many hospitals impossible, officials say. In Al-Shifa hospital, surrounded by fighting, 36 premature babies are still fighting for life, doctors tell us. 
Israel releasing pictures of incubators, saying it would send them, but without any details, and there's no news this morning. The president urging the Israelis... The hospital must be protected. But from a children's hospital now in Israeli control, Israel's military releasing this roughly edited video with claims unverifiable by NBC News that this is a Hamas hideout and a place where hostages were hidden. This is Hamas using hospitals as human shield, as terror machines. A three-year-old American-Israeli hostage now named as Abigail Moradan, her parents murdered by Hamas along with 1,200 others. And it's almost four weeks since Hamas posted this video of 21-year-old hostage Mia Shem, her mum fighting every day for her release. The only thing I know is what I saw in this video. And in a few days, it will be a month. In the video, Mia says she had three hours of surgery in Gaza in a hospital. Wherever she is now, her mum just wants her home. There are talks happening that may lead to a, some kind of a deal. What do you... Do you have a sense of what you would want, what you want to see? I just want to see Mia at home. I don't care how um, I'm only a mother who got up to this crazy situation, to this terrible, terrible situation. And all I want is to get her back. And Joe, this morning we just got news of the death of a 19-year-old Israeli soldier hostage, Noah Marciano. The Israelis say that they have informed her family. Hamas announced her death yesterday and put out a, a video of her when she was being held hostage, when she was still alive. I've got to say, Joe, the strength of these hostage families that we've been speaking to is extraordinary. Absolutely. All right, Kier Simmons reporting from Iraini, Israel. Kier, thank you so much. Let's bring in Dr. Barbara Zinn. She is a pediatrician and volunteer at the Palestine Children Relief Fund. She arrived in Gaza on October 6th for a three-day mission, ended up staying there for a month before being evacuated through the Rafah crossing. Dr. Zinn, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, just tell us a little more about the work that you were doing before you were evacuated. What was it that you witnessed over the last month? Well, I was um, supposed to see children with chronic diseases through the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. This year, I was going to see 100 patients in Gaza, new, new sponsored patients. Um, since I was evacuated, I've been in contact with some doctors in Gaza. Yesterday, I heard from um, Dr. Abed, who was from Al-Shifa Hospital, talking about 46 babies that were transported over to the main hospital because they had no power, they have no water to, to mix the milk, the formula for these babies, they have no way to keep them warm, they have no way to keep it, the area sanitized. Uh, they really have nothing to take care of these babies, and it sounds like from your previous uh, report that that number's gone from 46 to 36. Um, we know this has been coming. The hospitals have been telling us how much fuel they had, how long that was going to last. And obviously that date is is long past. And so um, Dr. Abed felt like none of those babies were going to survive. How concerned are you about what we're seeing at the hospitals right now? Well, the hospitals, the two children's hospitals are non-functional. Um, one of those is where we had our pediatric cancer center with, uh, built by the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. It took years to build because of limitations on supplies that were able to come in. So we have 12 of those cancer patients. And now we have, you know, 46 of these newborns, which is now, I guess, 36. So there is no, there is no hospital care for, for children in North Gaza. For the 36 babies who were taken off incubators because of the power situation, talk to us about the risks these newborns are facing. Is there anything doctors can do in this situation? They are doing their best to keep the babies warm, but they can't, they can't mix formula. A lot of these babies are tube fed if they're premature. So, so then you have to keep tubes clean. You have to have those supplies. You have to have water to clean, to clean them. You have to have um, like I said, warmth and and clean water and electricity and and so the staff is doing their best. This staff has to come in, endangering their lives even to get to work, leaving their families at home. Every family has suffered losses. 
So just the fact that there is staff there to me is is amazing and a statement to the dedication of people there for their children. Doctor, obviously it was important for you to get to a safer place, but I have to imagine it wasn't easy for you to leave either. I mean, just what's going through your mind right now? Well, my concern right now, obviously I'm in a safe place. My concern is for the people of Gaza and just um, the massacre that's happening for these children, especially. Dr. Barbara Zinn from the Palestine Children Relief Fund, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. NBC News White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. He is in Washington with more on what we can expect from today's massive march in support of Israel on the National Mall. Gabe, good morning. Uh, hi there, Joe. Good morning. Well, law enforcement here in the nation's capital is on high alert already. Several streets are shut down in and around the National Mall as tens of thousands of people are expected here later today for this march on Israel. And we've been seeing more and more rallies like this both here and across the world as tensions continue to rise more than a month into this war. As the fighting rages in Gaza this morning around the National Mall, security preparations are underway for what's expected to be the largest pro-Israel rally in the U.S. since the war began. MPD has asked for mutual assistance and support from the National Guard. The Department of Homeland Security now labeling the March for Israel a level one security event, one of the agency's highest designations. Tens of thousands of demonstrators are expected here. And we're going to be part of this historic moment. Overnight, some were bussed in from across the country, including this group from Boston. They're demanding Hamas release its hostages and an end to anti-Semitic attacks. How significant is this moment for Jewish Americans? To be seen together, that we're not intimidated, we're not scared. We're going to come to the most visible place in the United States of America, the National Mall, between the Capitol and the White House, uh, and we're going to stand together. Earlier this month, a pro-Palestinian demonstration in Washington ended up at the White House gates. In Chicago Monday, a Jewish group in solidarity with Palestinians renewing calls for a ceasefire. More than 100 demonstrators arrested. Now more than ever, it feels absolutely imperative to say as Jews, as Americans, not in our name. Among the planned speakers at the March for Israel in D.C., Alana Zaitchik. Six of her relatives are hostages in Gaza, including a five-year-old and three-year-old twins. It follows my every breath. It's there constantly, all the time. There, it's indescribable, the uncertainty, the not knowing, that is so, so painful. And this March for Israel is expected to get underway here on the National Mall this afternoon. And meanwhile, the Biden administration is expected to roll out later today new tools to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on college campuses. Joe. All right. Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, thank you so much. For the first time, the Supreme Court has adopted a formal code of conduct. The decision follows months of criticism about allegations of ethics lapses. The high court has been under pressure ever since several reports earlier this year raised questions about whether the justices are following the rules. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the details. Hey, good morning, guys. Of all the things on the Supreme Court's to-do list, the pressure for ethics reforms seems to have finally struck a nerve. The justices say this new code should clear up the public's misunderstanding about how they govern themselves, but it's also raising more questions. This morning, new ethics rules for the nation's highest court. A formal code of conduct now in place after a steady drip of stories on some of the justices' undisclosed trips, private jet rides, and other perks. This 14-page document signed by all nine justices now laying out how they should avoid the appearance of impropriety, when to recuse from a case, and reaffirming the existing rules around gifts, a move some members of the court had previewed was on the way. What we could do is just adapt the code of conduct that the other court systems have. I think it would be a good thing for the court to do that. Public pressure to do something has been mounting in recent months after reporting about Justice Clarence Thomas in particular and years worth of unreported luxury vacations paid for by a top conservative mega donor. Something Thomas said he believed he didn't need to report at the time, but has more recently updated his disclosure forms. 
I think it's clear that every member of the court has run into problems in the last few years. This is not just a problem that, that is besetting conservatives. This new ethics code, experts point out, still leaving much up to the justice's own discretion and doesn't answer what happens if someone breaks the rules. It remains to be seen whether they're going to take this seriously or whether they're just doing this to get everybody off their backs. But I think this is a really good first step. But not enough, says a top Senate Democrat on Capitol Hill, still pushing for legislative reforms. It may fall short of the ethical standards which other federal judges are held to, and that's unacceptable. And if it falls short, the American people will ultimately have the last word and the integrity of the court is an issue. Bottom line here, it's not exactly clear how these rules are going to be enforced and who would actually enforce them. So the justices essentially still operating under an honor system. Back to you guys. All right, Laura, thank you so much. We turn now to new developments surrounding the 2020 election interference case that's unfolding in Fulton County, Georgia. Extracts from confidential interviews, first reported by ABC News, then obtained by The Washington Post, are offering bombshell new details about former Trump's, former President Trump's former attorneys who pleaded guilty last month. NBC's Garrett Haig is in Washington with the very latest. Garrett, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. <clears throat> These are from proffer videos, and they're part of the defendant's plea agreements. They require true and accurate information be shared with prosecutors, and they had to be provided to attorneys of the remaining co-defendants during the discovery process here. Now, NBC News has not yet independently obtained these videos, but what's been revealed so far shines a pretty bright light on what prosecutors may be dealing with in this case. This morning, new revelations in the 2020 election interference case. His instinct was he had won. Pardon my French, but I've been through this whole thing. Through a series of taped interviews between prosecutors and defendants who've accepted plea deals, first reported by ABC News and published by the Washington Post. He said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. In her session with Georgia prosecutors, Jenna Ellis, a former Trump legal advisor who pleaded guilty last month for her efforts to overturn the election, detailing to prosecutors an alleged conversation with top Trump aide Dan Scavino at a White House Christmas party. He said the boss... Um, uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care. NBC News has reached out to an attorney for Scavino, but has not heard back. Meanwhile, in an interview that lasted nearly three hours, ex-Trump lawyer Sidney Powell positioning herself to prosecutors as one who frequently communicated with the former president. On the 18th, the only real justification that he's giving you to why he's not bowing out is that his instincts tell him that he won. That and the evidence that I'd shown. Powell testifying Trump had been repeatedly told he had lost the election, but relied on his instincts and allegedly leaned on her for advice, according to Powell, though she acknowledged she never practiced election law. He never told you, like, this is crazy, stop giving me the, this information. No. In a statement, Trump's lead Georgia attorney slamming, quote, any purported private conversation as meaningless, writing in part, if this is the nonsense line of inquiry being pursued and this is the type of bogus, ridiculous evidence D.A. Willis intends to rely upon, it is one more reason that this political travesty of a case must be dismissed. Now, during his interview with prosecutors, co-defendant Kenneth Chesbro also testified that Trump himself was aware of that so-called fake elector scheme. According to The Washington Post, during an unreported White House meeting, he offered advice on assembling alternate slates of electors in key battleground states to cast ballots for Trump in states that Biden actually won during the 2020 election. NBC News has reached out to attorneys for Chesbro, Ellis, Powell, and Scott Hall. Joe, we've not heard back. Former President Trump and the other 14 defendants in this case have, of course, pled not guilty. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. Paul Pelosi is speaking out for the first time about being brutally attacked in his San Francisco home. He testified yesterday in the trial of David DePap, the man accused of attacking him with a hammer last October and plotting to kidnap his wife, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Paul Pelosi said he woke up to find DePap in his home holding a hammer and asking, 
Where's Nancy? Pelosi sustained a fractured skull in the attack. DePap is charged with attempted kidnapping of a federal official and assault on the immediate family member of a federal official. He has pleaded not guilty. NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sinadella joins us now. So first of all, what stood out to you about Paul Pelosi's testimony? Well, first of all, it's brave when anyone gets up there and retestifies to their terrible trauma. But what's most legally relevant is that he says when the defendant entered, he said, where is Nancy? And because these charges relate directly to assault of an immediate family member of a federal official, kidnapping of a federal official, that is extremely relevant to the prosecution's case. Let's talk about some other parts of the testimony. An FBI agent testified about evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, collected from the crime scene that includes a hard drive with pictures of the Pelosi's home and a list of other targets, included celebrities and other political figures. So how is the prosecution trying to connect the physical evidence and that list of potential targets to really depaps his preparation and his intent? So they're connecting this physical evidence also with expansive digital evidence trying to prove that for him he was trying to attack a conspiracy. He was trying to attack Nancy Pelosi based on her acts as a federal official. So he has alleged that he is doing this in order to really go after the liberals who he believes have harmed America. So there is a whole story there that the prosecution has built. And this hard evidence with all those other individuals together was super relevant. So DePap's attorney not denying that her client attacked Paul Pelosi. She's arguing the motivation doesn't match the charges. So federal officials say he committed the alleged crimes in retaliation for then Speaker Pelosi's work in the House. The defense says his actions are motivated by conspiracy theories. What do you make of that strategy? Well, look, the defender did not have a lot of options here, honestly. So that's why she's attacking via this very narrow legal strategy. And I think it's going to be very hard to prove because at some point it's all relevant that they were attacking based on his her role as a federal official. So whether or not it's conspiracy based or whether or not he was just using her to get to more, it's still that she was a federal official. All right. Angela Sinadella breaking it down for us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We may see some warmer temps before the weekend. Really warm temps in some areas. So let's get a check in your morning news now weather forecast with meteorologist Angie Lastman. Good morning. Good morning, Joe. And I've got good news for folks that want to keep the shorts out, I suppose. Especially if you live in the middle of the country, that's where some of the warmth is. Stretching up into portions of the northern plains and even into the Midwest. Today, in places like Chicago, we're going to head to the mid-60s. You can see the warmth has stretched most of the plains down to the south, places like Texas, southern portions of Texas, into those low 70s. These numbers running 10, 15, even close to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. So yes, the warmth will be there through the day today, and that even lasts into tomorrow before we start to see some seasonal conditions getting back into the picture. Meanwhile, we've got heavy rain draped across parts of the southeast, specifically along the Gulf Coast. We've got some coastal rain out west as we gear up for an atmospheric river. Uh, and then we've got some snow showers in extreme northern portions of New England. Let's focus on the rain along the Gulf Coast, though, because this is going to be difficult for travel today and even into tomorrow if you live in this region. New Orleans, Mobile, Tallahassee, all dealing with the rain in and out throughout the morning. This is going to be the spot that will continue to see the rain falling across um, that region through the day today. Notice we have a flood watch. This is going to go into effect for Wednesday morning and last until Thursday morning. Why? Notice we don't have a whole lot of rain over the state of Florida right now, but we will as we get into tomorrow. So some additional rainfall means the flooding concern will be there, especially in that area where it's not hard for it to flood. Here's the deal between now and then. We've got the storm system sitting in parts of the Gulf of Mexico. It's kind of slowly but surely moving its way to the north and east, but at a snail's pace, really. So the heavy rain is continuing to push on in towards the shore, and we're dealing with uh, that, that rain that stretches all the way up into the southeast through the day today. Could be a little difficult difficult on that afternoon commute places like Atlanta. Meanwhile, as we get into tomorrow, it's really the state of, the, of Florida that sees the heaviest of the rainfall, but it's still parts of Alabama stretching into uh, Georgia and northern portions of Florida dealing with that rain too. But the heaviest of it, like I said, South Florida uh, is expecting anywhere from three to four inches of rain with isolated amounts up to six and even eight inches of rain. So that's gonna be something that we'll have to watch here over the next couple of days for flooding concerns uh, in that area. Meanwhile, the hurricane season's not over just yet. If you Ooh. thought it was, we've still got 16 <laughs> days, Joe, um, and a pretty good chance for this area to develop. It is right now in the Caribbean Sea. We'll probably see a tropical system, most likely a tropical depression forming as we get into the later parts of the work week. But uh, either way, we're going to watch for impacts 
most likely to places like Jamaica, Hispaniola, Cuba, uh, that part of the Caribbean could see some potential impacts down the line. But like I said, it's still kind of unorganized, but does have a good chance of developing here as we get into the next uh, couple days, probably by the end of the week. And, it, you know, it just shows you can't let your guard down nope. until uh, November 30th exactly. officially <laughs> rolls around in hurricane season. Keep that in mind after Thanksgiving. Ends. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate no it. More to come on this hour of morning news now, including a fresh look at inflation in America. We've got those breaking numbers and, of course, what they mean for your wallet later in the hour. But first, after the break, new developments in the wake of that scary incident involving President Biden's granddaughter and a Secret Service agent who opened fire outside of her D.C. home. What police are saying this morning about the investigation. Stick around. We'll be right back. We're back with some international headlines. Nepal is waving goodbye to TikTok. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. Well, Nepal has just announced that it has banned TikTok, claiming that its content is, and I quote, detrimental to social harmony. Now, the country's Minister of Communication told the BBC that the Chinese social media app spreads malicious content and that the ban will come into effect immediately. But not everyone in the government agrees with that decision. A senior leader of the Nepali Congress, Gagan Tapa, criticized the move, calling it an attempt to curb freedom of expression. Nepal joins a long list of countries that have already banned TikTok. Let's go to Australia now, where dozens of people walked out of the detention centers after the High Court ruled that indefinite detention is illegal. While the arbitrary detention of asylum seekers and refugees is not allowed under international law, Australia continued to detain people who arrive illegally in prison-like facilities. Following the decision by the High Court on November 8th, about 80 people, mostly asylum seekers and refugees, were released into the community with 92 more eligible for release. And finally, some good news for the global economy. According to Goldman, Goldman Sachs, the world's economy will top expectations in 2024. The investment bank forecasts an expansion of 2.6% next year. That's above the expected 2.1%. Strong income growth and confidence that the worst of rate hikes is over are among the reasons behind the optimistic forecast. But last week, the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, suggested that more hikes may be necessary to tackle inflation. Back to you, John. All right, we'll talk more about the latest read on American inflation coming up a little later this hour. Claudio, thank you so much. Now to new developments in that incident outside the home of President Biden's oldest granddaughter. The Secret Service detail assigned to protect her opened fire on several people that they say were trying to break into a government vehicle. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins us with the latest on this. Kelly, good morning. Good to see you, Joe. Both the Secret Service and the Washington Metropolitan Police are investigating this incident. An official told me two or three suspects were involved and fled in a red sedan. So far, they have not been identified or found. So part of the inquiry now is focused on determining why a federal agent who is on routine leave fired his gun in a densely populated residential neighborhood. Security around the first family is meant to be tight and is sometimes tested, a risk the president declined to discuss. Any concern about your granddaughter's safety, sir? The president's eldest granddaughter, Naomi Biden, was at home in the Georgetown section of Washington late Sunday when police were alerted to an issue. Dispatch, just be advised. I think it's 2D and it's a... Uh... Secret Service involved. According to a statement from the Secret Service, agents spotted trouble near her home. Possibly three individuals breaking a window on a parked and unoccupied government vehicle. One Secret Service agent fired a shot. New this morning, Washington's Metropolitan Police Department saying the officer involved shooting incident remains under investigation and will be independently reviewed by the United States Attorney's Office. The high-profile incident adding to a spike in crime in the nation's capital. Car theft here up a staggering 98% over last year. Authorities say there was no threat to the president's granddaughter. Naomi Biden has a public profile of her own. From the campaign in 2020. Get in that race, hurry up. To the first ever White House wedding for a president's grandchild last year. And attending a state dinner last month. The White House careful about what they called 
a personal matter. He is, uh, speaks to his grandchildren regularly. He's very close to his family. I'm just not going to get into uh, confirming conversations with his family. The president's granddaughter is a 29-year-old lawyer. She and her husband, Peter Neal, had been living right here at the White House around the time of their wedding last November. Officials would not say when they moved to Georgetown or if this incident would have any impact on their living arrangements. Joe? All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. Coming up, those of you who are looking to sail the high seas this holiday season may want to take a second look at the cruise industry's underlined rules on pot amid a post-pandemic resurgence in bookings. We've got some do's and some don'ts while on board. Next. Cozying up on a cruise ship is a popular holiday option for many families, especially those who don't want to cook. But as the industry experiences a massive post-pandemic resurgence, some of the biggest cruise lines are reminding passengers about some important do's and don'ts of sailing. NBC's Sam Brock has more from the Port of Miami. Sam, good morning. And Joe, good morning. You know, they say the grass is always greener. Maybe not exactly in this case. As you mentioned, Joe, the record level of attendance we're seeing right now on cruises has shattered even the 2019 high water marks, pun intended. However, we are now moving forward and understanding that cruise lines are putting their foot down. It's federal law. They have said this from the beginning. They're going to observe it. These uh, cruise lines are actually traveling out in international waters, which changes the game. As for the don'ts that you mentioned, do not bring pot to the party or else you're going to pay the consequences. With the holiday season coming full speed ahead, passengers are ready to soak up the sunshine and enjoy all the amenities a cruise has to offer. We believe fun is a choice. But that still requires plenty of good behavior, including honoring a contract passenger sign not to use pot. For a lot of people, they skim, they sign, they don't think twice about it, but everything is spelled out there. As more and more states legalize medicinal and recreational marijuana, cruise ship companies are reaffirming their rules. According to Royal Caribbean's policy, marijuana, even in its medicinal form or for medicinal purposes, shall be prohibited. The same goes for Carnival, which recommends passengers consult with their physician for other suitable alternatives to marijuana and CBD. Some passengers and potential passengers questioning the status quo. I can smoke wherever I want, but I come down here, I can't smoke. You have an edible format, you have a vape format, and you have a flower. So it's really, it's getting into the semantics of the law. Cruise companies say they have zero tolerance with fines and even jail time possible. I live in California or I live in Florida where there's, you know, medicinal marijuana is allowed. Why can I not use it on the cruise lines? What's the answer to that? Well, cruise lines are privately owned, but the bigger issue is that these cruise ships actually sail into international waters, and the cruise lines don't control the rules of the international waters. Many Caribbean countries, for example, ban pot. Company enforcement tactics include scanning all bags passengers bring on board, going through security again after each stop, and even hiring staff to look for illegal substances. For one of the hardest hit travel sectors at the height of the pandemic, AAA notes the industry has seen a remarkable comeback in recent years, with Thanksgiving trips already mostly sold out. As families pack ships, this mom of four says it's important to follow the guidelines, even though she's seen plenty of rule breakers. We just came off of the cruise. Um, there was a lot of weed smoking, but none around kids. There were a lot of kids around, but I do think people should follow rules. Joe, we did reach out to several cruise lines. We heard back from Carnival, which redirected us to their policy, but also emphasized this, that medicinal marijuana is not legal in many of the ports that they travel to. By the way, also camouflage clothing, not legal in many of the ports that they travel to. Go figure, it's because it represents the military for some of those countries. So there's a lot of fine print you gotta look at before you get on a cruise ship. Joe? The cruise is suddenly not relaxing anymore. You got all this information and <laughs> preparation you have to do. All right. All this heavy reading. <laughs> exactly. Not supposed to. All right. Sam, thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. From the seas to the roads, one of the nation's busiest roadways is shut down indefinitely after a fast burning fire over the weekend in California. And officials say arson is a possibility. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the details. The badly burned stretch of Interstate 10 spans only 450 feet, but its impact has severed one of the nation's busiest roadways, snarling traffic, slowing commerce, and creating logistical nightmares well beyond downtown Los Angeles. 
this is like a lifeline. With its structural integrity at risk, the overpass was a thriving artery that shuttles some 300,000 vehicles every day, carrying nearly twice the number of cars as the collapsed section of I-95 did near Philadelphia. The 10-lane bridge in Los Angeles is now shut down indefinitely. Losing the stretch of the 10 freeway will take time and money from people's lives and businesses. Saturday's explosive fire engulfed a pallet yard under I-10, even torching a fire truck. Guardrails melted, chunks of concrete fell to the ground and exposed layers of rebar. I am intimately familiar with this site. Just last year, the governor was next to this very section of the Santa Monica Freeway, working to clear large homeless encampments. The exact cause of the fire is under investigation. The area where it started is leased to a private company. That private company is also under investigation for how it managed the property. With arson a possibility, there is still no timeline on when repairs will be made. The city notorious for traffic has now lost one of its busiest roadways. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. Coming up, the latest read on inflation out just moments ago. And by now, you've got to know what that means. Our economic dream team is here to crunch those numbers. Brian Chung, Caleb Silver, the Charlie's Angels of Cha-Ching. There's two of them, not three. All right, that's next on Morning News Now. <laughs> We're back now with breaking economic news. The monthly inflation report out this morning, giving us an updated look at the state of our economy. So according to the Consumer Price Index, prices actually unchanged from September to October when it was up two tenths of a percent in September from the month before. Here's the big number we worry about overall, 3.2 percent year over year. Breaking it all down for us, NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung and Investopedia editor in chief Caleb Silver. Good morning to both of you. So, Brian, let's start with you, economist. We're expecting maybe a slight increase month over month. So how do consumer prices in October compare with September in previous months? What should we know about that? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, compared to September, prices went sideways. They didn't really increase or decrease overall. But again, there's a lot of numbers here. So let's contextualize it because what we want to really look at is not necessarily the monthly change, but the yearly change. So prices in October, 3.2% more expensive than they were in October of this time last year. Now, if you look at the September to September period, that was 3.7%. So the rate of price increases is slowing, although prices are still going up. Again, that's a positive figure, but it's encouraging to see that the rate of inflation has come down. Again, recall, in the summer of last year, this rate was somewhere closer to 9%. So the rate of inflation is slowing, although economists really want to see this number a little bit closer to 2%, Joe. So, Caleb, what are the headlines here, especially as we get into the holiday shopping season? Yeah, it shows us that it is cooling a little bit, inflation. And remember, it was also 7% at the beginning of the year. So we're down in this 3% range. When you look at what's more expensive, and Brian will dig it into it a little bit more, it's still shelter prices and food prices. We're still paying more for that, and we should expect that. That's going to be persistent inflation in those categories. But that 3.2% number is important. Why? Because that's where consumers think inflation is going to be for the next five to 10 years, according to consumer Fed expectations of inflation looking out. So we're kind of where we think we're going to be, although, as Brian mentioned, the Fed wants that at 2.5%, 2%. Got it. So, Brian, let's break down some of the numbers by category. Any areas that are considered winners or losers? Yeah, well, what we're looking at here is three main categories, food, energy, and shelter. And I want to highlight these are monthly changes here. So what I'm talking about is the difference between September and October. The food price index actually went up by 0.3%, if I can start to write. There you go. 0.3%. Energy prices, interestingly, went down by, get this, 2.5%, owing in part to prices at the pump declining over the month. But shelter, this is the biggest expense for most Americans, actually slowing their pace of price increases, only going up by three-tenths of a percent in the month of October. That's a slower pace than the 0.6% we had seen in the month of September, which is certainly encouraging, given that's such a big expense. Now, on a real-life basis, let's take a look at some average prices. Egg prices, if we're comparing over the year, $3.5 almost last year. It's actually gone down to about two dollars and seven sevenths uh, now and gasoline prices as uh, of the average of all types down to three dollars 91 cents uh my handwriting is really going off the rails here and then three dollars <laughs> 93 cents for milk and then bread going up so you can see in some price categories you are seeing prices increasing like bread but again you're seeing other categories declining which i'm sure is welcome news ahead of thanksgiving the eggs stand out because we did four million stories on we eggs did. you know about a year ago so it's great to see those prices going down so caleb we know the federal reserve has been not 
not doing interest rate hikes over the last few meetings. They'll meet again, what, in about a month? So yeah, 29 days, 5 hours, and 30 minutes. You always have the countdown for us. So what can we expect then when they meet in about a month, especially with the holidays coming? The expectation is that they will hold again. Even though they've been talking tough about potentially having to raise interest rates to finally tamp down inflation, I think this report tells us that they're going to be done for this year. And now the drumbeat is getting louder about rate cuts next year as the economy slows. All these rate rate cuts have really slowed the economy, not necessarily inflation. They've slowed the pace. But they're talking now about rate cuts potentially next year. So probably no rate cut in December. We're probably where we are, the terminal rate for the Fed. And that's good news, actually, for the stock market and for consumers. We talk about this goal of 2% inflation year over year. Is that possible? Do you think we can actually get to that? Well, what's weird is it took forever to get to 2% up until the pandemic and post-pandemic. And now trying to keep it down back to 2 2.5%, that's hard. So we have this persistently high inflation in that 3 to 4% range. This is probably where we're going to be for a while. All right. Brian Chung, Caleb Silver, our economic dream team, breaking it down for us. Thank you both. Appreciate it. We've got more financial headlines now. Starbucks baristas are reportedly about to drop the coffee and head for the picket lines this week. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and other money headlines. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, so unionized baristas at Starbucks are planning their biggest strike this week, accusing the company of refusing to negotiate fairly at stores that have voted to organize. Starbucks Workers United says thousands of employees at hundreds of locations will stage a one-day walkout on Thursday, and that coincides with Red Cup Day. That's the popular annual promotion when Starbucks gives out those holiday-themed reusable cups. Now, the union has successfully won elections at more than 350 stores, but none have yet to reach a collective bargaining agreement with the company. Meta is rolling out a way to delete your Threads account without also nuking your Instagram. You can now remove your profile from Threads through the settings menu. This addresses a complaint with Threads, which requires you to sign up with an Instagram account. The update comes after Meta introduced another change, allowing Threads users to opt out of having their posts promoted in the main feeds on Instagram and Facebook. And Amazon will allow Snapchat users to buy products without leaving the social media app. You'll be able to see product details, real-time pricing, whether the item is eligible for prime-free shipping, and delivery estimates on select Amazon ads in Snapchat. And Amazon recently struck a similar deal with Meta for Instagram and Facebook. Just more ways to make it easy to shop, right? I take our money. <laughs> exactly. In every way, every format. Yeah. Just make it quick and easy. All right, Silvana, <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate sure, it. Thanks, Jeff. It was a blunt at the box office this weekend marked the Marvel Cinematic Universe's worst film debut ever. The Marvel set a new low for the once dominant franchise. NBC's entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas is more on the possible superhero fatigue and what went wrong. Marvel mishap. I don't like that name. The Marvels, starring Brie Larson, the latest installment in the superhero cinematic universe, earning just $47 million at the U.S. box office. This makes it the lowest debut for a Marvel movie ever. What is happening to me? It's a steep fall from the success of its 2019 predecessor, Captain Marvel. That smashed opening box office expectations with over $150 million domestically. The $100 million drop-off, unprecedented. I think the Marvel fans are a diehard bunch. They know when a movie is off. And in that case, they won't go to it. The film that Disney spent $220 million to produce was plagued during production with weeks of reshoots and a SAG strike that limited the traditional promotion that actors could do. You took everything from me. And now I'm returning the favor. In just the last four years, Marvel has released 11 movies and 10 TV shows. I am inevitable. As the franchise tried to keep up with demand in the streaming wars. Plots have gotten thin. Films and TV shows have rushed onto the series and into cinemas. And... They're just not up to the standard that they were before the pandemic. Even Disney CEO Bob Iger admitting to the Marvel fatigue, telling CNBC back in July, 
There have been some disappointments. We would have liked some of our more recent releases to have performed better. Noting the simultaneous release of movies and shows diluted audience interest and stretched resources too thin. Marvel's a great example of that. They had not been in the TV business at any significant level. Not only did they increase their movie output, but they ended up making a number of television series. And frankly, it diluted focus and attention. Now the highest grossing franchise of all time will look to revive its cinematic universe with seven upcoming movie releases, including two more Avengers movies. Avengers! Assemble. With billions of dollars invested for years to come, Marvel hoping its superhero strength can hold up to the weight of expectations. Our thanks to Chloe Malas for that report. Coming up, we are once again flipping the script with a massively talented music educator who goes by the rather fitting name of the girl conductor. She made her Carnegie Hall debut this past summer, etching her name into the history books. In the process, Maria A. Ellis joins us live. That's next. Back now with our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on air, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. This morning, we're meeting one of the first women of color to conduct an orchestra at Carnegie Hall. Maria A. Ellis is a music teacher and conductor who has performed all over the world, and she is here with us in New York to talk about her amazing career. Good to have you with us. Congratulations. <laughs> it was in June that you performed at Carnegie Hall. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was just amazing to join the ranks of other African-American women who have graced that stage. So it was like a dream come true. I performed at Carnegie Hall in 2017 with my college choir, and I said, whenever I come back, I'm coming back as the conductor. So for that to happen in about six years was absolutely amazing. And I got to bring my, my high school choir with me as well. Oh, that's awesome. It was so much fun. How, what was going through your mind? How did it feel to just be up there in that moment? Well, this was my first time ever conducting orchestra. Really? Yes. <laughs> so what was going through my head was just don't mess up. But it was so much fun, and I practiced really hard. I'm working on my master's at Webster University, so I was working with my professor, Dr. Trent Pratteson, and we worked very hard for two years to prepare me to get there. And once we get on that stage, it was just... It was magical. It was so much fun. That you didn't start small. You're like, this is my first time conducting yeah, an orchestra, go and I'm going to do it at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> I love you. Brought with me here your batons, right? I did. I did. All pretty and pink. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we use as an extension of our hands, so that the orchestra and the choir can see what we're doing. And you kind of get it like fit it to your hand. It's kind of like Harry Potter where the wand <laughs> chooses the wizard. It's kind of like that. But you find one that fits in your hand really well, and um, you know, I, pink is my color, so I had to find a pink one. You've got the pink baton. You've got the pink shirt that says That's Girl right. Conductor. That's Talk right. about Girl Conductor. Well, what Girl Conductor that? came about because I was not seeing women on the podium. I always knew I wanted to be a conductor. Um, I started conducting choirs when I was about 12 years old and just never saw women. I only saw white males. And when I saw my first woman, black woman conductor, was 2020, Dr. Jan Taylor. Wow. Yeah, and so I wanted to create a platform so other girls could see themselves on the podium. Because sometimes if you don't see yourself doing it, then you just believe that you don't do those things. So that's where Girl Conductor started. It has now evolved to create more diverse music education resources. Um, I try to use all different types of genres of music to teach music literacy. Talk about that, because, I mean, for you, you didn't necessarily get the education that was best for you growing up, right? Yeah, growing up. Um, I've been in a choir for as long as I can remember, but my school didn't teach like basic music literacy, like um, how to sight read, meaning just pick up a piece of music and just read it. We didn't learn those skills. And so when I went to study at college, I didn't get in the first time because I didn't have those skills, but I worked really hard that summer, auditioned again, got in and just started working. But then after work and I said, there has to be another way that, that we can still speak this same language, but we can speak it in a way that everybody else can understand it. And so I started using gospel music and hip hop and pop and finding different ways just to teach. Making music relatable is so important, especially when it comes to young people. I also love you host, it's a radio show, yes. right? And it's called Bach and Beyonce. That's right, Bach because and Beyonce. there's a lot of common ground there, right? There is, there is. There's a lot of common ground, not only just with the music, but with the stories behind 
behind these incredible artists. I mean, we look at Bach and sometimes we put him on this very high pedestal, but Bach had a past as well, and we don't talk about that as much. So I love comparing those two worlds together. I know you say that you're a conductor of heartbeats. Talk about yes. what that means. What that means is when we sing together, when we make music together, our hearts beat as one. Mm. And I have the privilege and the honor to stand before ensembles and get our hearts beating as one so that the audience can then feel the energy that we have on stage. What does that feel like when you're in that moment and everyone's sort of Oh my gosh, it's, it's unreal. I always tell singers, you can always tell when you're singing in tune because the room will speak back to you and you literally get chills running through your body because you have hit that chord, you've hit those right notes. And then the audience, they feel it as well. You see them smiling and getting excited as well. We have about 30 seconds here, but what is your top message to a young person who's looking at you and says, I want to be just like Maria? The sky is the limit. So you have all these incredible people who have already started this path for you. Come join us and widen it and make it bigger so that everybody has access to music literacy or conducting or whatever they want to do in music. That is amazing. Maria Ellis, you are an inspiration. Thank we you appreciate so you coming here. And you got to run back to St. Louis now, That's right? That's right. I got rehearsal tonight, so <laughs> rehearsal I have to get tonight. back. So don't worry. If you're watching right now, she will be at rehearsal tonight. Everything's going to be okay. Maria A. Ellis, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but please stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.